So section five of chapter 10 in the note packet is only like half a page long. There's not much to it. I just have some explanations here of the types of solids that are described in your textbook. The textbook has some better uh, diagrams of what these look like. First, we should point out the difference between crystalline, which is an ordered structure, and amorphous, which is a disordered structure. Something that is crystalline tends to have a more sharp melting point versus something that's amorphous that would start softening and melting over a range of temperatures. So I sometimes compare this to a stack of plates that if they're all the same size and the same brand and the same shape and you have a stack of plates and you're trying to shake a table, then when you get to enough energy shaking the table, the whole stack is going to fall over at once. Whereas if you have a stack of plates that is a more disordered stack, maybe different sizes, different brands, slightly different shapes of plates, then when you are shaking the table and increasing the intensity, you might have the top of the stack fall off and then maybe the middle of the stack fall off. So you might have more of a range of speeds of table shake where different pieces of the stack are falling off. So you tend to have a wider and also a lower melting point if you have impurities or if you have an amorphous uh, structure. So let's take a look at what these look like. So here is a diagram in your textbook trying to illustrate the difference between an ordered crystalline structure and a more amorphous structure that has a little bit of disordered shape to it. So the other types of structures that are detailed here in this section are all types of crystalline ordered structures. We're going to spend a little bit of time in the next section focusing more on ionic solids and metallic solids, uh, the unit cells that are found in these ordered crystal structures. But there are other types of ordered structures as well. You can have a covalent network where the structure is held together by covalent bonds. So it's an extended network of covalent bond. Many minerals have this type of ordered structure. There are also molecular solids. So things that are molecules can become solids. They can be frozen. And then um, that can have an ordered crystal structure to that as well. So you might think of sugar. Sugar is a molecular solid. It's a very crystalline solid whereas salt is also an ordered crystalline solid, but it's an ionic solid. And then the end of the chapter talks about types of crystal defects that can be found. Slight, um, slight pockets of disorder within an overall ordered structure. So here we have a diagram of an ionic solid it has different types of ions. We have some cations and some anions in a repeating ordered crystalline structure here. And that is a little bit different from a metallic solid because in a metal, all the atoms are atoms of the same metal. So we have an ordered repeating crystal lattice structure with only one type of atom instead of having two types of ions here. So a covalent network is something that is not just a molecule. So here we have silicon and four oxygens and we don't just have one molecule of this. We have silicon, each silicon atom here in the structure is bonded to four oxygen atoms and then each oxygen is bonded to that silicon plus the next silicon over. So we have a very long extended chain going in all three directions. So they're just all bonded to each other with covalent bonds rather than this ionic structure where they're just attracted to each other because of their negative and positive charges. So these are actually covalent bonds extended across a long, uh, a long area, long volume actually. So we have a few examples of that. We have diamond. We have silicon dioxide, which is in the mineral quartz and lots of other minerals. Uh, we have silicon carbide here with carbon bonded to four silicon and then each silicon bonded to four carbon and just extended 
throughout that structure. We have graphite, which is another form of carbon. Uh, it makes for a good lubricant because it, instead of being extended in three dimensions like diamond, graphite is extended in sheets. And so the sheets are not covalently bonded to each other. Within the sheet, the carbons are covalently bonded to each other. And then the sheets can slide past each other. So like uh, pencil lead or um, uh, graphite that you can use as a lubricant they slide past each other, they have a little bit of a slipperiness. Also because of these extended structures and uh, some delocalized electrons on here, these are, this is the only example of a covalent network that does conduct electricity pretty well. These other covalent networks do not generally conduct electricity. And the last example here we have is uh, molecular solids. So carbon dioxide, instead of being just a metal atom or cations and anions, we have an ordered assembly of carbon dioxide molecules. When it's frozen as a solid, it can form an ordered crystalline structure like this. And here we have iodine molecules. When they become a solid, can, can form an ordered crystal structure similar to how an ionic or metallic compound can form. So here we have a table summarizing the properties of these different kinds of solids. I also have a little summary in the note packet as well. The solids that are the most conductive are the metallic solids. And then also if you melt or dissolve ionic solids, then they can conduct electricity. But as the solid ion itself, so sodium chloride as salt, as a solid salt does not conduct electricity very well, but once you dissolve it, or if you melted it, it would be able to conduct electricity very well. Because of the strong bonding in a covalent network, these solids tend to be very hard and have very high melting points, so they're very difficult to break up. So you can just think of diamond or quartz to be able to think of the properties of those kinds of solids. And then molecules are just really variable because you can have all different types of molecules and when they freeze and become solids, many of them do have an ordered crystalline solid structure. And finally, we have a diagram in your textbook showing different kinds of defects that are possible in an ordered structure, little pockets of things that are out of order. So you can have a vacancy where one of the pieces of the crystal is missing. You can have something substituted either with a similar size or with a different size, an impurity substituted in there. Or you can have an interstitial impurity where there's just something added into the small gap that is already happening between these solid, likely they're metal atoms. And these kinds of crystal defects can you can lead to useful properties in the material. So uh, sometimes they are put in there on purpose. They can be pretty desirable, especially in the uh, area of computer chips and semiconductors. So I encourage you to look at the different representations and graphs and diagrams of these types of solids and try to connect what you see in the structure with the properties that are being called out in these notes and in the chart in your textbook.